Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. We're back in the shop today to apply some metal finish and some stock stain to our CVA Hawken kit. As we prepare to go through with this, it's important to take a couple steps here to make sure this goes as smooth as possible. And what I mean by that is we want to go through and degrease all of these parts. But before we do that, try to have as much of this around as you can and on your bench. You can see I've cleaned off my bench except for this file here. And I have, a, I have a work surface here where I can go through and work on all this stuff. So the first thing we're going to do is degrease it and, and degrease our hardware. And to do that, I'm going to just use some rubbing alcohol here and a paper towel. What degreasing does is it removes any of the oils that have come off from your skin or your shop or your bench or whatever from the metal hardware. And it's going to give you a clean reaction surface for your solutions to get into the metal and, and work evenly. If you don't degrease your metal hardware, you run a risk of, of seeing little fingerprints, little oil track marks, little rings in your metal finish that the solution can't quite um, eat through on its own. So it's important to go through and degrease this, this stuff because you have a better chance of getting uh, an even surface of your finish on this stuff. Now, on that note, we'll get to that a little bit later, but we're going to go through and do multiple coats of our metal finish uh, to help that even coating go on. Um, so we've got our rubbing alcohol here to degrease everything, and then I've got a bunch of cotton swabs or Q-tips here that we're going to apply the solution uh, to or, or with, and then I've got our two primary solutions here. For the bluing, we're going to be using Brownells Oxfo Blue, and for the brass black, we're going to be using uh, Birchwood Casey here. I'm not going for a super dark uh, look for this Hawken kit, uh, so we're going to apply a few coats and rub this back with some Scotch Brite that I don't have. It pays to go through a little bit of a dry run in your head about what you're going to do. I guess there's a piece just right there. <laughs> it's important to go through and kind of check these things off because once you get going, uh, you're going to have gloves on. And you're not going to want to go digging through things. Uh, these solutions go on and they're a little time sensitive. So uh, it's important to kind of be prepped and ready before you do that. So I'm just going to rub these items down with this rubbing alcohol. And then I'm going to let it just evaporate and dry. I'm not rushing that at all. Um, while it's drying or evaporating, I can go through and, and prep some other things like our stock for stain if I need to. Now that this is dried, we can go ahead and start our metal finishing. I'm going to start with my bluing because I have less parts to blue. So we'll knock those out real quick and then we'll jump over to the brass black. Something I didn't mention before, I mentioned it in the other videos, is you want to have some kind of container to pour your finishing solution out into so you don't contaminate your entire bottle. Um, there's just a little bit left in this Brownells Oxfo Blue. Um, I think we can finish it up with this little project. So I'm gonna be dipping out of this container, but generally you wanna make sure that you have a, a container to pour your solution out into. And that's what we're gonna use with our brass black.
Fast forward a couple days here. I had some issue getting the Brownells Oxfo Blue to take to this barrel by waiting the, the recommended few minutes between coats. So what I did was I gave it a good overall clean coat and I let it set for a few days. Uh, you can see here that it's kind of dark and nasty now, but we're gonna go through with our damp scotch bright here and see if we can remove this uh, griminess and get us back to the standard dark blue that we're going for. Letting it set a few days was a recommendation from my father. Uh, he's an engraver by trade and then, you know, at times goes through and will refinish things, reblue things uh, as needed. And, and that kind of trick he brought up there, is he recommended because sometimes that, that brown owls oxfo blue just does not get a chance to go through and eat into what you're working on. And you can see here, it's done a pretty good job of actually getting into that steel. And we have a much darker, uh, much more even color, I think, looking at it here. And I'm not scrubbing hard with this and this scotch bright. This is just a gentle, gentle rub of the scotch bright on this barrel. And just enough to get some of that water in there and get it moving around some. I use the water, I, I haven't talked about it a whole lot, uh, but I've found that that water leaves me with a nicer rub uh, on the metal and and this is primarily for the brownells oxfo blue and then even the the uh, birchwood casey brass black that i've been using sometimes with my um, scraping with that scotch bright i get too high of a contrast shift in color that i'm not a fan of um, i'll have spots that are real bright and i'll have spots that are real dark but I find if I wet that scotch bright, I get an even removal of that color and I get a much better, in my opinion, final color. Now you'll notice I didn't blue the underside of the barrel back here towards the breech. It's never going to be seen. Um, if you're real particular about how you want things done, you can go through and blue that entire thing, but um, it's not necessary in my opinion. And I will say as far as blued finishes go, um, I've noticed the Brownells Oxfo Blue with repeated cleaning, like you have to do with muzzle loaders, does not hold up um, exceptionally well. It is going to lighten depending on how much you shoot and clean your muzzle loaders. So keep that in mind. I'm, I'm exploring some other bluing options, but for the purposes that I've had so far, it does a good job and I don't mind it lightening up over time. Um, on my Kibler Southern Mountain Rifle, it's done a good job of, of giving it a nice patina that I enjoy. So it's really up to you on what you're looking for. You notice I'm wearing gloves when I'm doing this. Um, you start to get some runoff of this material and it can get onto your hands and things. You know, for a little job, I'm generally not too concerned about it, but um, something like a barrel like this where we've got a big section that we're working, I think it, it's good to, to make sure you put on a pair of gloves. As always, follow the recommended health and safety information. <laughs> so looking at this now, having it all rubbed back uh, we have a pretty good finish i think it's not a it's not a stellar perfect finish uh, but it is a nice hand applied finish if i want to uh, i'm going to come back here in kind of the later hours of the day and take a look just to get a different perspective on this um, and in that case we could come through and blue it again if we wanted to for a few more hours if we want it to be a nice, you know, perfectly even finish. For where we're at now, I think this looks pretty good. 
uh, for what we're going for. When it comes to the brass parts, I'm gonna apply the brass black just the same as I did with the Brownells Oxfo Blue here. I'm applying it with a Q-tip or a cotton swab onto their cleaned brass surface, and then I'm setting that to the side to allow them to dry. Um, the brass black, I went through and did three coats in total on these parts to get the total finish that I was looking for. I wasn't going for a super dark finish on any of these parts, but I wanted to make sure that I had an even finish on these parts. And I kind of wanted a, a 30 or 40 percent finish on here, meaning I wanted it to be 30 or 40 percent darker than the shiny polished brass. You can see here, this is another difficult part of how we did this butt plate and, and how I would do it differently in the future um, because there was no way to remove this butt plate. I had to apply the black to the plate as it sat on the stock. Um, I was really careful. I got a little bit of the brass black into the stock, but I don't think that it affected the overall finish of the stock looking back on it now. And then to polish and remove the brass black material, I take just a slightly damp Scotch-Brite and then I'm rubbing it back to my desired color on here. And I'm going really gentle with this. I don't want to be too aggressive. I don't want there to be like lined, like sanding or file marks on this. I want it to be an overall kind of uniform finish on this stuff. It has just a little bit of texture, but overall shows off an even color that is not that ultra polished bright brass. This piece isn't an, an overall aged piece like we've done in the past, but I wanted a uniform look across these pieces. Something I've always liked and I've always heard about about the CVA Hawking kits, at least some of the early ones, is that they had uh, walnut stocks. And we can really see that up here in our four stock. Unfortunately, as we get back here towards the back of our stock, we have a lot of punkiness in this wood. And, and this lighter area of wood here is really soft. I mean, I can dent it with my finger just pressing on it. So uh, because of that, I'm, I'm a little concerned about stain and finish. Now, if this was straight walnut and we didn't have this punkiness, I think that we could come away with just a simple application of oil. And you see that being done a lot with nice grade walnut stocks on things, applying some oil, and you're good to go. So I want to try a couple things and show you how I try a couple stains on a stock like this uh, before we really get into it, just in case. Um, just in case that simple application of oil isn't going to work. So uh, to test first, I have just my standard Danish oil here. You've seen this used a lot on the channel um, and some other videos that are out there. And then I've got my Verithane gun stock stain that we used on um, that traditions hawking. With my cotton swab and my stain ready to apply here, I want to search for an area on the stock that's going to be hidden, but that has attributes of the entire stock. So typically I would just apply a test stain uh, splotch here in our barrel channel, but our barrel channel doesn't contain any of that punky wood. Uh, and I think kind of by design and by selection. In here in our lock mortise though, we do have a little bit of that punk coming in here. So I'm going to take just a cotton swab, a little bit of stain on it here, and I'm going to apply it back here to the back of our lock mortise on the inside. And then I'm going to do a spot just right there on the inside of that mortise as well to give us a little bit of the lighter color and a little bit of the darker color of wood that we have there. Then with the other side of our swab, get a little bit of oil here. Either way, if we go stain or no stain, we're going to be applying oil to fill the pores of the wood after. So oil is just something standard that you're going to want to see and do um, with whatever you're working on. And we're not going to have as much of an area back here. But you can see how different that wood is looking as far as color goes between our straight grain and some of our punk up here. We're several degrees lighter to my eyes up here than we are down here and you know depending on what <clears throat> and depending on what you're going for you might um, you might like that differentiation in color i'm going for a more uniform look on this piece um, so i think just off the cuff here because it's pretty well dried i think we're going to go with the verithane stain here it's going to give us a nice rich color i think 
that's going to work. This is a good all-around, you know, duty stain as far as I'm concerned. So just to prevent any contamination, I'm going to close up my oil can until we need it just a little bit later. When doing a Hawken kit like this, I find that it's easy or, or useful really to come up here and grab our nub where our nose cap is here. This gives us an area that we can grab with our fingers that isn't going to be seen. And a lot of times we can get up into this barrel channel for a good grip as we're working on this stuff. So I've got a clean brush and we're just going to go in. I'm not worried about our butt plate back there and this stain. We should be able to just wipe it right off. And I'm just going to go ahead and get down into these mortises and things. Traditionally, you don't see those finished out ever, in my experience, on original pieces. Uh, it's really up to you, though, on, on what you want and, and what you want out of your muzzleloader. I'm not going to fault anybody for doing that. Um, it's interesting that we don't see it, I think, in, in original pieces. we got some running back here we want to make sure we take care of. Just to prevent any runs, any streaks in that stain. We'll just come in here and give it a rub. And we want to give that a few minutes or a few seconds, really, I guess, um, depending on the wood that you've got, just to just to soak in and penetrate that stock. Don't go through and just wipe it down immediately. Um, if you want a lighter color out of something, sometimes you can get a lighter color by doing that. But generally you want to make sure you have a nice deep penetration with that stain. You want it to get right into that wood grain and really populate it. I just love how that stain color looks there on that four stock. I think that's a, a decent color for walnut if you ask me, at least on this CVA walnut that we have here. Just giving that stock a rub down here and I'm going to apply a second coat just to see if it changes anything for us. Wood, those wood pores might already be saturated but sometimes you can get a little bit more out of it. And when you're using just a, a general wood stain like this, um, you know, it's pretty cheap and overall you don't use a whole lot. If you're looking for some more appropriate or more historically accurate uh, muzzleloader stock stains out there, a lot of the both kit manufacturers and, and muzzleloading supply shops have and, and stock a variety of traditional stains that have been used as long as contemporary muzzleloaders have been being built really uh, that have some really good rich color many of them uh, designed to to emulate the things seen on original pieces. They generally come in smaller bottles but as you can see here we don't use a whole lot when doing something like this. Something that this stain will do if you let it sit on a stock is it, it can become sticky and you don't want that and the same thing for oil. Uh, so as you're applying this stuff you don't necessarily want to let it sit for a few days uh, because it can become sticky. Uh, when it comes into oiling the stock after we've got the stain done there's a few things you know the old adage I think it's oil once an hour for a day, oil once a day for a week, oil once a week for a month, oil once a month for a year when it comes to um, a muzzleloader stock and, and building one. And in that case a lot of times that wood is going to be soaking up and absorbing that oil in those early stages. Uh, when we first apply oil to this, you'll see it's just going to soak it right up. But as we get to those later stages where there's not as many pores to fill, you're going to see kind of the opposite. Where that oil begins to sit on top and if left uh, unrubbed or unscraped, it can get a little gnarly on us, which we don't want. We have a little bit of color shift, I think, between the punk and the straight grain. But overall, I think that brought us back to a, a fairly true through color. 
I'll let this dry for a few hours and we'll apply a little bit of oil to it. After a little bit of time here, we're ready to apply some oil. So I've poured out a small amount of oil into kind of a contamination free uh, tray here. This is just something that's used for oil. So that coloration you're seeing in there is just old oil sitting in there. And I've got a fresh, clean, um, just a cheap hardware store brush again. Uh, I've seen folks apply oil and stain with like a scotch bright to kind of rub it in uh, to the wood grain as they're applying it. Uh, but I think uh, in my experience, I find that that is a little more useful down the road uh, as we get into some of our later layers of oil. And really nothing <laughs> special in the way I do this. Obviously there are, are better people out there to, to learn from and take classes from, and, and I encourage you to do so if you're interested in that. And I just kind of apply just a nice even brush stroke of this oil. You will notice your mortises swelling up after the first couple coats of oil. I generally put everything back together before finishing the oiling process. Even those initial first couple uh, oil coats are going to make things tighter around your hardware. You might find in some cases that you need to adjust your inlets, expand them a little bit with a chisel. Most of the time though on these kind of kits things are able to be pressed back in. So even apart from the areas where I've been holding this, you can see here where we have some end grain exposed like on the underside of this cheek rest here, that oil is already soaked in and drying. You can see that change in color there and the change in sheen really. Up under here as well on our toe, you can see we have a lot of end grain coming through here that does soak up that oil really quickly. That first coat of oil, I'll just kind of stand here. Um, and this is where um, having a podcast or the radio play in or something um, can help pass that time. Or you can just have some, you know, some good self introspective time as this oil kind of soaked in. I don't want to rush this process. The longer that you go and the easier that you go with the oiling process, the better that it's the result is going to be for you. So don't apply a coat and rub it off immediately. You know, if you have a drip running uh, like I do up here in this little mortise, you know, don't be afraid to come in there and soak that up. But oiling this much like oiling furniture or any other kind of wood is just a little bit about patience. You're up against the physical limitations of the wood and the natural limitations of it to absorb that oil as quickly as it can. And you, you want it to absorb it the way it wants to absorb it in time. Slowly, you're going to get the best results. That oil is going to fill more pores in the wood and it's going to give you a better finish in the end. Coming in for round two now, after waiting a little while, it's going to apply another pretty wet coat. I will wipe it off with that butt plate on the end just because I don't want it to dry there and become sticky. Uh, if you do get some oil that becomes sticky, uh, generally, you know, d don't freak out. <laughs> it happens to us all. Uh, taking just a, a red or maroon scotch bright to it will cut that back pretty quickly. Uh, and it's not going to ruin the finish. A lot of people will apply the oil that they apply to a stock with a scotch bright because it gives them a nice matte finish. But if you want a glossy finish with just your straight oil and by not going to a, a polyurethane uh, kind of sealer, you can just apply a few more coats of your oil with a brush on top of that scotch bright layer and you should be okay. Because I was holding it here with the wrist, I'm going to use the last of the little oil in my tray here just to even up that area. 
So we'll lay that here, let it set, let it dry, come back and apply a few more coats. That's really the majority of what we're gonna do now from here on out. So I won't show you every single coat that we apply here. Um, like I said, generally the, the rule is to apply as much oil as the stock will take uh, until it starts to stop absorbing that. And you'll see that by it just changing in color and sheen and the uh, areas of the stock won't accept that oil. The oil will just sit on top. So like right now you can already see we're starting to dry through here. And this is just really quickly after I sat it down, I'm starting to see it dry a little bit in up here and around these mortises here as well. So with that said, you know, it's up to you. Uh, many people will get by with three coats of oil. Many people will want to do a full year of oiling and they'll use it in between, but they'll want to do that full year of oiling because of the old adage. It's really up to you and your comfort level. If you had a hunt coming up or if you were really sick of building your Hawken kit or your kit of any kind, you can go through and wait for this to dry up a little bit, rub it down, final assembly and take it hunting uh, if you really needed to get out there. So this from here on out is really up to you. I'll spare you a little bit of the slow oiling process here, uh, but this is pretty much the last thing we have to do to this kit before we do our final assembly.